if you have comments, make them uh, as short as you can. If you have a question, uh, please let us know to whom that question is directed to, and please introduce yourself first. Go ahead. Yep. <clears throat> My name is Pei Emerson. I'm an entrepreneur in education. And I think education is one of the most important things. It's, as you said, one size doesn't fit all. A trend in education today is that you are getting in more and more private entrepreneurs to work alongside with governments. I'm running at present 100 schools for 35,000 students in, in six countries. I have one school in Jeddah with 1,000 students perceived to be one of the best in Jeddah. I had very interesting discussions with the Minister of Education here just before the pandemic because we see enormous potential to go in with private investments and do education here. So that's just my reflection when we talk about this. Make sure to use the private entrepreneurs. I've also been part of a big UNESCO study, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Peace and Education in, in 50 countries. And you show that there are more and more alternative ways of doing education that could complement and be a catalyst to a change in providing a better education. Go ahead, please. You take it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I'm Hiro Akita from Tokyo. So uh, I'm not the Middle East expert, but uh, since I'm from Asia, based on the experience in Asia, I really agree that the economic in inter-regional economic cooperation is very, very key to sustain or avoid the conflict and maintain the peace. Based on that, I have a question to Mr. Nal, uh, Al Niadi, and if possible, I'd like to ask a question to the chairman. And my question is uh, this. In order to uh, deepen inter-regional economic cooperation, maybe ideally Israel should be included because they have uh, high tech, they are economic power, but I, might, I wonder if, how do you see the potential or possibility in long run that Israel will be included in the Middle East regional economic integration and cooperation? And related to that, how, how about Iran in that context? Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me start with Abdurrahman, then Dr. Muna, on that question. I'm not going to answer. It's good that I'm not speaking in this session. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll, I'll answer it in two, two elements. Uh, the first one is the idea of including all regional states, including Israel, within the uh, concept of uh, regional uh, economic integration. And that has already, uh, we've seen some uh, initiatives on that uh, going uh, back since the Abrahamic Accords, there were the I2U2, there were the Negev Forum, and they're, they're all directed into reaching that economic prosperity uh, goal in which it enhances the quality of life for the people and show that there is uh, there could be a change of narrative in the region. That's that's uh, the concept of of uh, these many laterals uh, as um, too many laterals that came out of uh, the idea of the Abrahamic Accords to start with. Uh, the other the other element uh, uh, I I would like to to mention is is uh, in term of compartmentalizing. Uh, we. Um, do not see eye to eye with many countries when it comes to politics. But that's not a prevention from uh, pursuing economic uh, mature interest. And that's where we engage all countries. From the UAE perspective, we engage all countries in the region. We have dialogue with everybody. We, bu we build bridges with everybody, including Iran. And the idea is to expand on that mature interest ground to achieve the, the economic prosperity that we pursue. And maybe a part of your experience is basically that. But that requires also two main things. One is um, uh, an agreed upon principles and values, values and principles of non-interference, of respect of sovereignty, of cooperation, and also uh, requires uh, pragmatism and compartmentalizing uh, your engagement with countries. So, you uh, work on what could be a mature ground of, uh, of interest and you avoid 
uh, tackling straight away the divergence of views. How, however, uh, that also doesn't mean just uh, being fixated on getting the low-hanging fruit. You also need constant dialogue to deal with the divergence of views in the longer term. Thank you. I was it's wondering if he, if he wanted. If he wants. He wants. Uh, talking about education, education is one of the main themes we have in Egypt, is to concentrate on education. I don't think we do that enough. The, uh, what is allotted to education is far less than what it should be. So words are good, but the execution is not. So now, talking about Iran and about Israel, Iran, as you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia were, had an entente through China, which was very good and which was accepted by everyone. So it was the first uh, uh, approach to, China, to Iran in the Arab world. This is one. The other one is Israel. As you know, Israel and Egypt have done the peace process now for 30 years, and it has been sustained. We are very, very scared that this new tragedy might fragilize the treaty with Israel. Uh, I, I will make a comment, and there are questions here and there, and here and there. Um, you know, we have two types of, um, of meeting at our leadership. One focuses on political issues, the other one on economic issues. If you take all the economic summits, uh, uh, which we pay a lot of attention in my institutions, they are all successful. They agree on the issues, and we go and implement. For example, in, in, in Kuwait, they have agreed on the importance of uh, putting a mechanism for cross-border payments. We at the Arab Monetary Fund actually initiated a, a new institution based, you know, executing that objective. In Saudi Arabia, they agreed to increase the capital of the financial institutions. It has been implemented. So we, you, are, you will take all the su summits at the level of the leaders. Whenever, whenever it is economic summit, very successful, agreement, you know, we ended up as our culture, kissing each other, hugging each other, etc. Whenever it's a political summit, they will leave without shaking hands. So we need to pay a lot of attention to economic. What would, how Europe got together? Europe was in, in fight. They got together on the grounds of economic and financial issues, economic ties. This is what we need to pay attention to. And lately at the Arab Monetary Fund, we have been advising, you know, certain um, um, relevant ministers on, on those issues. Let us please focus on economic and financial issues. And I think we are no different. We are no exception. We can agree if we would. And, and the, uh, for example, el electricity connectivity. It, we have made good progress in connecting different countries in, in terms of electricity. So whenever you know, projects of benefit, we have no issue. The difficulty when we speak about political issues, where do we stand from different issues, that's where we have differences. We have a question here, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Karim Ambar. I have a question for Mr. Abdurrahman Niyadi. As I work in the field of women empowerment, I would like to know uh, if there is a national or international policy of the UAE. Uh, regarding what you uh, mentioned, women empowerment to counter terrorism. I mean, we have always saw it as a part of our women empowerment uh, objective. We, we have always saw it as building healthy society, is building more resilient society to the ideas of extremism. And that has been always within the, the vision that we have. I'm not sure if there is a, a global push 
to look at it from that perspective. But that's to be clear, women empowerment is, is that that is one element of women empowerment. Women empowerment is much larger as well. It has also that economic uh, um, economic um, goals uh, of uh, enhancing uh, the um, uh, economic work workforce, the entrepreneurship, and and all that within the same spectrum. But I wanted to shed light on uh, addressing the idea of extremism through an angle of uh, creating a healthy society, which women is a fundamental part of it. Thank you. Very short one. People think of agriculture and farmers as men. Very far from that. Most of the agriculture is done by women. We work with 6,000 farmers and we are shocked. We're starting, we reach 20,000 farmers in Egypt. When I go to the community, I move my office to Said. I'm dealing more with the women farmers. Oops, uh, I think it's a sign from above. I should go. The second point is I talked about food consumption and wellness. This is purely will come to the issues of teenagers and pre-teenager food intake. And this is again back to the woman uh, important role. So in terms of food security, woman inclusion as a critical component not as a nice thing to have, but at a critical component of either producing food through agriculture or consuming proper food and nutrition, women are like in the center of this puzzle. And we are now working more and more with women and that's getting us to a lot of issues related to it in the Middle Eastern society of who controls the economic wealth among the farmer community. But uh, that's something I believe we need to look at. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to President Al-Hamidi. Uh, I'm Riyad Tabet. I am a city planner and urban uh, sociologist. In the area, the Middle East area, you have uh, countries with a high income level per capita, and we have countries with very low level of income per capita, even though these countries might have a, an important resources. So from your point of view as a president of the Arab Monetary Fund, do you think that the development problem of the area is a prob economic, demographic, or politic? Or all the above. We have, we have issues with political issues, security issues, economic issues. But I, I, I really think that when, Mandur, do you want to take that so you relieve me from answering that? We, let us, I think we should focus on, on the issues. I think youth is very important. Listen, we have the right paradigm in the region. Other regions, they are getting into, um, um, you know, the, the old age. Our region is, it has youth, 60%, in some countries 65% below 40 years. Therefore, we need to, ch to change the look or the way of our economic development model. Uh, 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 on how to work out with this new generation. Um, what I, as a Saudi, what I, the changes I have seen, because now those in the leadership positions, mostly young, they can interact with the youth, not my generation. They know what they want, and they do it perfectly. So I don't need to go to Saudi anymore. I use my mobile for all my needs. <laughs> And that was not introduced by my generation. It's introduced by the current generation. And I agree, uh, you know, giving women opportunity. I was at the university. My first career was in the academia. And I taught uh, uh, um, uh, also ladies. And I, they, you know, at that time, they A's for them and C's for the boys. So... 
They are very, in Saudi, they are very educated. Once they are given the opportunity, now 30% of the labor, 35% of the labor market in Saudi are women. Who would believe this? In, in six year time, we went up to that level and therefore changing the model. Before, you, before it becomes imposed on you because you need it. This is, I think, what, what UAE also was a leader in this. And I think that we have, um, we have um, uh, other countries like Jordan, Morocco, because we work with all those countries, also Jordan and Morocco in terms of the clean energy. I think they have done a, a very good job um, and, and therefore, yes, there are models that are working. Unfortunately, you know, challenges comes from everywhere. Um, Sudan is a, an issue. Uh, Palestine now is another issue. And therefore, um, again, I, I believe somebody from this region, we need to focus on economic issues. Our leaders should focus on economic issues. I think that could help in enlarging our market. You know, the the... Uh, the Arab common market was agreed upon before the Europeans. If you go back to that, that was in the 50s. 56. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, uh, and we, uh, where are we now? We implemented nothing. Exactly. Because we went off the economic issues. I think we should go back. We have a very large market with the youth population. The private sector could be very vibrant with what we have. You know, with, with all those issues, clean energy, educated, young, male and female, I think we can. But we need to change the paradigm. Let us give the young generation the opportunity. They are given in the UAE and Saudi, and they are making a change. This lady, please. Yes. Uh, Sumeya Abdelatif, uh, uh, Vice President of uh, Robert Schumann Institute. My question is for Dr. Amuna. Can you tell us more about the solution of one state that uh, Mr. Dahlan announced, uh, proposed, or it's just an announcement uh, effect? No, I think he's very well read about the, 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 the solution. He is born in Khan Yunis. He is from Gaza. He was... Uh, he was in charge of Gaza before, before he, he, he fell off with uh, Abbas. I think he is the best person to do this. Now, the idea of a one-state solution was first proposed long ago by somebody called Rashid Khalidi, in, in case you know him. He's a big professor of political science in the United States, very well appreciated. And it was his idea that two-state solution is not feasible. After what is happening now, I don't think it is feasible. Mr. Netanyahu has killed the two-state solution. Khalas, you can't, you can't go back to it now. So you have to think of something new. And I think that Mr. Dahlan, who is very much involved in this, he has the, the, the protection of the uh, UAE, uh, uh, ruler, he's the advisor of the UAE ruler. He has good relations with the Israelis, with the Palestinians, with General Sisi. You can't get better. I think that he is has he's putting oh, he's putting uh, uh, he's putting his all his credentials in in place for people to pick up what he's saying. I personally will write an article about him. I'm very much for Mr. Dahlan. He, must not, he might not be the best, but he knows his, his, uh, the issue, exactly. And he has a very good supporters within Gaza. So just a question for Mona, on if the alternative was not Dahlan, but Marwan Barghouthi. If what? If the alternative was not Dahlan, but, but Marwan Barghouthi. Barghouti, whether it is Mustafa Barghouti or the other Barghouti, the and the one who is in jail is Mamdouh Barghouti, no, Mahmoud. Mahmoud Barghouti or Mustafa Barghouti, each one of them is Marwan, Marwan. Marwan Barghouti. 
Each one of them is probably better as a human being than Muhammad Dahlan. But Muhammad Dahlan is a politician, and he is accepted by many people on different sides. This is what we want if we want somebody to, to lead Gaza as it is now, because he even has uh, he has connections with the people of Hamas, having been born in the same uh, uh, the same community, which is Khan Yunus. So the others, I I respect them very highly, both Marwan and Mustafa Barghouti, whom I have known personally, but I don't think that they will be accepted either by Israel or by the rest. Thank you. Um, I'm Ahmed Awad. I'm in the area of human rights, and I work for the UAE government, so um, I'm UAE-based. Um, yeah, there's so many things very interesting, and uh, my question is to Madame uh, Mona. It's Hello, hello, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Ahmed Ahmed Awad. I'm in the area of human rights, and I work for the UAE government. Uh, my note is for Madame Mona. Uh, whether uh, I wonder if you have thought about any reconciliation process. This is extremely important, especially in the light of what we hear on the, some news that there is the Palestinian in Gaza and Palestinian in the West Bank. Yeah. They're extremely important. So, from my experience, I worked in Geneva in the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Every time you have a conflict, if you don't have a reconciliation process afterwards, it will be very difficult to keep a uh, pace uh, moving. So, it is important, first of all, for the inter Palestinian inside the Palestinian themselves. Secondly, no donors, whether institution like the World Bank or whatever, or any state donors, will not give a single uh, euro or dirham if there is no consensus inside the, the, the country. So I think that the reconciliation process is extremely important to uh, address before any, going any further. Thank you. I think your, your remark is very well taken, because there will be no consensus if they don't have uh, some arrangement among them. But this is why I have spoken about Ahmad Dahlan, because he has the connections. He has the connections for different sides that are mostly warring at each other. But as he is born in this place, in Gaza, I think he has more privilege than any other. Inshallah. Questions, comments, speakers? Any comments? Abdurrahman, please. I just, I just want to comment on the presentation of... Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be quick on, on uh, Ernesto's uh, presentation. It's, it's very important because in, in policy, in foreign policy right now, we see a lot of... of uh, connection between uh, p policy and foreign policy and technical issues. We deal with it every day. It's very important. When you spoke about debuckling and uh, de-risking, we see it from a policy point of view in which you create, you try to create an, uh, an, an, uh, a strategic autonomy somehow to address the issues or to build the, re the resiliency toward issues such as uh, COVID-19 and other issues. It's, it's very important, and I think we should embrace technology going forward and could be a solution to many of, uh, of what we see in our world. Thank you. I may make a comment on this. The I also tried to deliver a warning that comes from the mathematical modeling. Deploying the technology uh, with, uh, you say, in a, in a, in a no-trust environment may not deliver the quality of optimization that you expect the technology to deliver. So the less the trust uh, uh, you want, uh, the, and the more uh, uh, you want to control risk, 
the less you can expect benefit you can expect from the technological based platforms collaboration so this is, was just by so we need to to balance between how much risk we want to take and how much we expect for the joint optimization to deliver that's that was just my point go ahead please my name is uh, Younes Zrikam. I'm uh, Moroccan and, uh, and French. I work at the Boston Consulting Group. I just wanted to, I mean, f many of you know, know that, but maybe for, for the others, uh, about the Palestinians, and as we are saying that the going back to the sta status quo ante is not an option, we, we have to remember, and maybe Mohammed Dahlan is, is an option, but we have to remember that there are different categories or different Palestinians. There are Palestinians in Gaza, there are Palestinians in the, in the West Bank, there are Palestinians all around the region. You know, 60% of the Jordanians are Palestinians. We heard 300,000 Palestinians in, in Lebanon, uh, in Syria, so on and, and so forth. There are the Palestinians in Israel, almost 1.5 million uh, Palestinian Israelis who have a, an Israeli passport. There are the Palestinians outside in Europe, in Northern America and, and elsewhere. So we have five, five categories of, of Palestinians and I think each category should be heard and taken into account in any political future, future solution. And um, I think it's what you said is important about the fact that Mohammed Dahlan was born in Khan Yunus and, and comes from Gaza, but I think probably a solution should take that into account. Because even in the, the Oslo negotiations, we know that they were mostly led by say, the diaspora of uh, Palestinian uh, abroad. And, and maybe that is one of the reasons why um, things didn't go uh, as, as, as well as they should have been. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have questions? Comments? <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> then please give me the opportunity to thank all those speakers, the seven speakers, for their very comprehensive introductory remarks. And thank you so much for making this session very active. Absolutely. And hopefully to see you in the near future in other events. Thank you. <laughs>